that it would be as safe as the regimen that I'm taking now, which leads me to undetectable, but it's only undetectable in my blood, right? Because the, the, the viral loads tests are only for what's in your blood. I heard Jeff talk about the different systems, it's in the lymph nodes, it's in the, it's in the gut, it's in the brain. So it, even though we're virally suppressed, that is only, we're virally suppressed because they're measuring the virus that's floating around and it's in our blood system. So yes, I would hope that um, it would be available quickly. I would hope it would be safe and I hope it would be durable. Thank you. Thank you, Juanita. Hi everybody, my name is Portia Dees and I am the chair of the Lifetime Survivors Special Interest Group with NMAC. Um, it's, they have a national HIV and aging advocacy network and so it's within the NAN. Um, and so what a cure means for me, oh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers as well. <laughs> and beautiful, I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> um, so I like looked up this definition and we, we typically think of like a cure as like a ba banishment of a physical illness from like our bodies. But this one, this definition was really good to me because it talks about repairing and strengthening of the mind and spirit to improve the quality of life, even when no physical cure is possible. And we had uh, the Lifetime Survivors and Dandelions, we had a strategy session yesterday and we were actually talking about this at the end of the strategy session. Um, you know, we grew up with the virus. We don't know, we don't have, um, like others who contracted it uh, behaviorally or later in life, like I always, we always hear of like a pre and post diagnosis identity and we don't have that, you know, like um, I, I don't know uh, a life without HIV. And so that would be, if a cure came, that would be my post diagnosis <laughs> experience that I would have to like, oh my God, like get used to, you know, like, um, I know we are much more, we, we say that all the time, we're much more than our status, you know, but again, for, for us, that's been a part of our lives for our entire lives, you know? So, um, yeah, we were, we were talking about that. Uh, and so, yeah, that'll be crazy. Don't get me wrong, I'll be in line for the cure when the cure comes. But, you know, that, that's just something to think about, you know, like for, for us, we were, some folks in the group were saying how they wouldn't want to get it, you know, so. <laughs> Good afternoon. So I am Bridget Piku. I am with The Well Project. I'm the stakeholder liaison for, for, the, for The Well Project. I cannot talk, it is late afternoon. <laughs> we don't work with each other. <laughs> um, I'm also a nurse by trade. I do HIV work as a work of heart but um, I'm also a nurse at heart. So for me, cure really has to consider the whole person. It's not just about, like Portia was saying, it's not just about curing the body. So we need to make sure that if we're gonna have a cure, that we also have systems in place that are gonna support the whole, por the whole person. You know, regardless of how long you've been living with HIV, it's part of your identity and who you are. And to have that taken away, means that things are gonna shift and change. Um, for some people who have been living with HIV for years and years and years, that means, what does work look like? What does my housing situation look like? What does my medical situation look like? Right, like HIV is not the end all be all. You cure my HIV, I still have diabetes, I still have cholesterol, I still have right, all of these things. So for me, a cure has to encompass how we're gonna take care of the person the whole person in all of our iterations afterwards. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, Jeff Taylor with the HIV and Aging Research Project in Palm Springs. And I'm a 40 year survivor of HIV, I'm 61 now. So I basically lived my entire life with HIV. Um, my entire adult life, I should say. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've been kind of involved in this work since they first started talking about a cure. And I'll never forget a researcher coming up to me probably about um, 15 years ago or so, and saying, you know, I think we should start looking at a cure. He said, we call it the C word, because you don't dare want to mention it. Somebody earlier said that, um, you know, we've been hearing about a cure since the, the epidemic began. I'll never forget um, Jonas Salk, the guy who famously cured uh, 
polio, saying, oh, I've got my Salk Institute, I'll do this. Well, he died and didn't <laughs> come into a cure. We keep hearing about vaccines. We keep hearing that a cure is gonna come in the next 10 years, and then 10 years, they say, 10 more years. So it's kind of this magical thing out there. And we're getting closer, and there's a lot of really great research, but um, it's, it's, a state, it's kind of a state of mind. It's an aspirational um, thing, and I think, now, for me, what I would love to see is, you know, as others have said, easy to take. Um, some of these things are really complicated that they're looking at. And our HIV regimens have gotten really simple. Um, you know, we're looking at, I'm on an injectable every two months. We're looking at every six months. Like, how do you beat that? The bar keeps getting raised. So it's, it's getting mm -hmm. harder and harder. But I think the other important thing that other people have touched on is the um, not transmitting it to others. You know, some of the things they're looking at um, is you can cure one person's HIV, but that doesn't mean that they can't get reinfected. So I think you want to be, have something that will make you immune to that. And that's why some of these gene therapy approaches are really exciting. And then the other thing I'd like to touch on is stigma. You know, we've been doing a lot of socio-behavioral research around this. Karine Dubé is an amazing researcher and my group and others have worked with her. And I'll never forget being in a, in a focus group and you know, ask what's the most important thing for you, and they said curing stigma. And nothing will cure stigma but a cure for the virus itself. So that, that's really stuck with me, and uh, I get for crime just thinking about it. So uh, I'll stop there, thanks. Thank, thank you all for sharing and uh, answering my somewhat prepared question. <laughs> um, so stigma, that, that is one of those kind of invisible clouds that unless we define what that stigma actually is attached to, it's hard to, kind of address this it, itself. Uh, it's like kind of trying to wipe away a cloud unless you kind of impact each and every drop, whether it's racism, homophobia, we talk about the stigma related to being a, an injected drug user or a lifestyle related stigma or whatever. Uh, all of those things are, are kind of part of that, 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 I guess, gravity that keeps us paralyzed, uh, whether we're HIV positive or not, we're just talking about it. Um, but all of you kind of alluded to um, this hesitation. Portia, you said like those people you know that if a cure was offered, they would, if they would hesitate or they would just not take it. Talk, talk more about that. Um, so, well, what they were expressing in the, um, in the group was uh, similar to kind of like what Bridget was speaking about, like, um, you know, if I get the cure, um, I mean, is that gonna stop the inflammation or the damage that's already been done to my body um, from living with the virus for so long already and the inflammation, the damage that has already been caused? Like, can you reverse that? <laughs> you know, like, I'm not sure. And just, um, um, I, I think again that, uh, that identity piece of like, that's been a part of our lives for our entire lives. So like, you know, I, I, I can sit here and say that I'm at peace um, with my status and with the stigma and with everything surrounding it um, by it. Um, like, because I know the stigma isn't personal. And again, that's, I think we all have echoed that, like that's become our purpose. Um, um, fighting stigma is our purpose, you know, so if you, if you uh, cure that, then what are we fighting for after that, right? Like, um, you know, I think that's why I feel like I was created, well, why God created me to dispel the stigma around HIV and what it means to live with HIV. So, I mean, I don't know, some of my thoughts on that. Um, I feel like y'all can expand. <laughs> You know, um, would I take an HIV cure? Absolutely. But I want to be 20th in line. Like, I want them to work the bug now. <laughs> and I say that tongue in cheek, but I really do mean that. It, it's very scary to be the first of anything. Um, it's very scary to walk into something where you don't know what's going to happen. And so that's one of the reasons that I think it's important that we advocate for each other to get involved in the research leading up to the process, right? It's kind of like, 
put your money where your mouth is. You can't complain about something after the fact if you didn't take part in getting there. So there are certain things that I would trade HIV for in a heartbeat. But there are other things you can keep. Like I take my pill and I keep it pushing. Um, if it's gonna be super complicated, like you were talking about simplicity, if it's gonna be super complicated, I'm cool. But I also know that I have to involve myself in everything leading up to it. Otherwise, I'm gonna get what I get and maybe what I get is not what's best for me. So. So what I um, take here uh, when it comes. So for me, I, I realized that women haven't been in most of the trials and researches. Women haven't been included. So that's one thing I have in the back of my mind. You know, we have this distrust for research as from, I'm saying when I say we, I'm talking about the black communities, uh, dark brown communities. I think we have like a mistrust or maybe a misunderstanding of, of research as it goes. So as I'm aging, I know that it's going to be probably have to take more pills than I'm taking now, or more um, type of um, uh, medical treatments than I'm taking now. And so I think looking looking for geriatric, I think I'm looking to geriatric <laughs> for me, like right now. Um, and it depends on I think for me it would depend on just how the cure would be, um, what me what mechanism would it take to get into my body, you know. If I have, you know, yeah, what mechanism? Like if it's, it's not gonna be another pill, that much I know. I feel like it may be invasive. Maybe you know Jeff, I don't know. So I just think about those sort of things. And like I said, as I age, I think more about, I think more about um, geriatric. And I think about that we haven't been there in the research. And I know they're just starting to do research on women, even with, the, even with dosages, dosages of medications for years, women and men have been taking the same doses of medications. I remember years ago, I was in Baltimore for some reason, and um, I had the stage, and we were talking about medications and dosages. And I called a friend of mine, up. I'm 4'11", there's a girl I know, she's about 4'9". I called her up to the stage, and there was a very uh, big guy in the room, and I called him up to the stage. I said, look at these two people. They take the same amount of medicine. What is that? Because when I was young, people would ask, the doctor would ask you how much you weighed before they would give you the medicine. They would give it to you according to how much you weighed. But with HIV, it's not the same. We're all taking the same dosages, no matter our gender, no matter our, our weight, our ages, anything like that. So, yeah, and I'm, I'm also with you, Bridget. Um, if they give it to me first, I'm going to be very, very suspicious. <laughs> because as a black person, we never get anything first. <laughs> so I need to say that as well. Thank you. <laughs> the portion was talking about you know benefits and things like that and i think for people who've been living with this virus for a long time um they've been forced to be poor it forces you into poverty if you're going to get access to medication care housing food support you know people were initially too too sick to, to work and needed all this even as they got better they didn't have a job, what do you do? People have been living for decades on their benefits. And now that you know people are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, what if they get the magical cure and you know, can they go back to work? They haven't worked for decades. And who's gonna hire somebody who's you know, 60 or 70? So I think <coughs> this causes a lot of anxiety and that's what Portia was alluding to. It's like, what does this mean for us and how we're gonna live going forward? You know, a cautionary tale I like to share is Timothy Ray Brown, the Berlin patient, um, when he came back to the U.S. and moved to San Francisco, he didn't have HIV anymore. He couldn't get HIV services. Yeah. He was living in an SRO, and then the people had to really fight to say, hey, <coughs> count him as HIV. He's still, you know, he can't work. He's got all these issues from, from the cure that he got. And, and so we really need as a community to be advocating to make sure that this population does not get forgotten. Because so you know the government's going to say, okay, Great, you've got a cure, pull all the funding, we'll move on, mm -hmm. and, and we're still gonna be here dealing with day-to-day -day needs and the PTSD. Just because the war is over doesn't mean those soldiers don't come home with PTSD. Mm -hmm. We have been through a war and there still are, so we need to think about the psychosocial impact too. What's an SRO? 
I, I'm sorry, it's, uh, single residency uh, occupancy. Um, those are the one room apartments that they uh, try to house homeless people in. You don't have to be homeless for a while before someone uh, forced the house that be to get him into that house. Yeah. You don't have to be living on the street. Right. Everybody doesn't have access to the homeless services like we do. <laughs> you know, um, I just since since um, Jeff did mention Timothy Brown, I remember being here. I think we were here in D.C. I think it was the International AIDS Conference, 2012, mm -hmm. and we had the PWA Lounge. They call it the P. It's the it's the long term survivor lounge now, right? <laughs> we're evolving. They had the PWA Lounge, but it was somewhere downstairs. Mm -hmm. And near the parking lot or something. You remember that? Yeah. And I remember seeing Timothy down there. He was walking around, kind of like he didn't know. I said, "Are you, you are you lost? Do you know where you're going?" He was like, "Well, I want to go to the PWA lounge, but I don't have HIV anymore. And I don't know that I should go there." Mm -hmm. He felt a loss of community, mm -hmm. and that's something else that's going to be real for us. Um, mm -hmm. That there may be a loss. Let me say this, community man, we rock. Yeah. This is the community. I really don't know. I really don't know what I would do without you all in my life. You know, you have carried me. We have carried, we carry each other. Best HIV community. is something I found that I just can't do by myself. And I like to I like to do a lot of stuff by myself. <laughs> I gotta do HIV with y'all. I can't do it by myself. And I felt Timothy's pain and confusion. And I thought he would always be a part of this community. Like, are you kidding? You better get on in that lounge. You know what I'm saying? But but his fear was real. That was his reality. And you know, and for some of us who are um, who are you know who are around that may be may be in for, may be fortunate enough to have access to the cure, don't go away. We're still here for you. You're still going to be a part of this community. You know what I'm saying? Because we built this together. So yeah, you all like. Um, what they call fundamental cornerstones to what we build here together. So I just wanted to bring that into the room. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing. And I'm just thinking, uh, was it 10, 9, 10 years, 12, no, 10, 12 years ago, PWA Lounge, now is the Long Term Survivors right. Lounge. What's it going to evolve to in five years from now? And a geriatric lounge. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 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 that's a fact. That's a fact. Community is one of the reasons that I say I would hesitate about taking a cure. Um, I just, I wrote a blog, and one of the things that I said in the blog is that <coughs> if I had to give back all of, get emotional, all of the relationships, um, that I have formed as a result of. So we talk about stigma all the time and how horrible stigma is, and it's awful. But I think sometimes we forget how much we've gained, right? Like, there are people in this room that I know that I would not know if not for HIV, who enrich my life. So when you talk about taking away identity, part of identity is the relationships that you have. And so if it came down to it and someone said, here is a pill, because I'm like you, Wahidi, you're not sticking me with nothing. Um, okay, exactly. Here is a pill, but everything that you know up to this point is gone. Bye. That, this is not that kind of thing. I think in the, op uh, the opening plenary, they were talking about the butterfly effect. So that's a butterfly effect for me. It's a ripple that gets felt, right? Like all of the lives that I've touched. Thank you. I said I wasn't going to do this, because I'm cute today. You can't, you know. um, but that's, that the butterfly effect of an HIV diagnosis is a real thing. It's not just your diagnosis. It's not just your partner's diagnosis. It's not just your family's diagnosis. It's everybody that you come into contact with, whether knowingly or unknowingly, you've touched their life in some way, or they've touched your life in some way, positive or negative. And so a cure is not the simple thing. It's not just science. It will never ever be just science. The science part of it is, is amazing and fascinating. And I encourage you, the series that was up there um, on long-term survivorship, if you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. It is the information that you'll get in there. I've learned something every single webinar. So 
the information part of it is amazing and fascinating, but it's the people part that we that is the point of that so that we can keep sticking the, 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 the human part into all of this talk about keyword. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking about the amount of like relearning. Um, I would just as everyone's talking, I'm thinking about my own kind of journey through uh, understanding and identifying uh, my own kind of path with HIV. Um, I was diagnosed at 18 as a freshman in, in, in college, uh, football player with pro aspirations. Um, I lived five years with that diagnosis without telling anyone because I just assumed I was going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that's what the doctor at the Norfolk uh, Red Cross told me, that I had about eight or nine years to live based on the amount of uh, viral, my viral load at the time. Mm -hmm. And so it took 20 plus years before I could even just acknowledge myself as a person living with HIV and eventually working in the field, and of course now I'm almost 40 years positive, it's, it's, it's part of who I am, it's part of what I do, it's part of our purpose, it's part of our identity, it's part of our networks, it's part of family, the, the community that we, we call family. Five years from now, we're gonna stay in the future. How do we continue that, that, that family, that connection? Like, do we transition? I talk all the time about the people we've lost over the years. Not just the people who lost to the virus, but the people who were dancers, who were teachers, who were lawyers, who were homemakers, who were just doing things, living their lives that dropped that to roll up their sleeves to be a part of this community to help others. How does, what does that look like? What does that sound like? How do we create that network, that community in, for the future? And I'm saying near future, like five years, 10 years and to pass to the next generation of people who will witness and experience this virus. I mean, we've all been talking about the amazing work that everybody here, here does. And a lot of it is not around HIV, it's around stigma, it's around intersectional um, um, discrimination and trauma and so forth. That, that's not gonna go away, right? We can't fix this. We, even if we fix HIV, we're not gonna fix our society. There's so much work to be done. And we've learned so much doing this and we've built an amazing community. I say we just leverage that and to, to do so much more important work to come. And, and diseases as well. I mean, we just went through COVID. I was shocked. I mean, that sent me into PTSD. It's like really 40 years later, same thing, brand new virus and CDC drops the ball, government drops the ball, panic, hysteria. It's like, really? And then MPOX, right? We had everything in place. They still messed it up. So yeah, there's a lot more. There's gonna be other diseases, other pandemics, lots of stigma and discrimination to address. So our work is not done, even if we want it to be. I'm all tired, I wanna go, you know, sit in Palm Springs and have cocktails by the pool, but I don't think that's gonna happen. <laughs> I just wanted to say, I wanted to talk about, you know I talk about, about passing the baton, Mary. Some of us talk about passing the torch. I always wanna talk about passing the baton because I remember when they passed the torch to Muhammad Ali at the Olympics and he was kind of shaky and he thought he's gonna like burn the Col Coliseum down. When we pass the torch, I mean, you kind of just pass it off and you just walk away. You don't know what happens. But when you talk about passing up a time, when you're in the relay race, at some point you got to be step to step and there's a portion where you're still together before that person goes off to win the race. So I think I'm talking about mentorship and community, right? And us sharing what we know. Me having information for me does me no good if I can't share this information with somebody else, right? And it may not be one-to-one, -one. it may be it may be a group of folks. I'm not really good at mentoring people one-to-one, -one, but I can mentor a group of people because then, you know, they can get their bet, they can like tear, pair up on their own and. Like develop. I've seen I've so many people here at this conference that I've mentored, that I've trained, that I've taught something, that I've given some of what somebody gave me, that I've passed the baton to, right? So I think that as we um, live longer with HIV, right, 
um, that the things that we've learned, the techniques, whether they're Debbie's, whether they haven't been proven, scientifically proven, if, you know, you know what I'm saying? Because some things just happen on the ground that are not measurable, that maybe not be measurable in terms of us being able to get funded for it, right? But people may not remember everything you said, but they will always remember how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. They will always remember how you made them feel. So I think that having the mindset of passing your baton, not baton, baton, <laughs> of passing the baton, um, for me, I think that's something that, that we should like look forward to, make sure that we're passing the baton, that we're just not dropping the mic, we're not doing mic drops here, <laughs> right? But that we have to actually be in step and mentor that person for a minute, and, to, and then that person goes on to win the race. I, I kind of want to want to expand expand on that because that for me, I think um, I want to touch on the intergenerational conversations piece because that's what's been like really, really, really like key for me <clears throat> with being a part. <clears throat> sorry, being a part of the NAN, the network, um, and being able to. I don't. I, I applied for the 50 plus scholarship in 2019, y'all. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I just was crazy and I wanted to get the whole full experience, the per diem, the... The, the 50 plus experience? Well, <laughs> no, I wanted to get... I wanted to, I wanted to get um, my hotel paid for. I wanted to get my flight paid for, and I wanted to get per diem. And none of the other scholarships had all of that. And I was like, you know, I'm not 50 plus, but I'm a long-term survivor. And I applied. I didn't think it was going to work. And it worked. Like, they let me in. Right. But, <laughs> but um, just Sam, echoing what you you guys have been saying, y'all, they let me in. Y'all are a part of the network, you know? And um you know somebody said if if we don't know our history then we're going to continue to repeat the the past you know and so like i've learned so much from being a part of the network like about our history they've given me so many trainings they've mentored me um and and allowed included um the like the lifetime survivors within the network you know it, it would have been the 50 plus um, um, advocacy network, but they changed it to a national HIV and aging advocacy network. And, you know, we got the Lifetime Survivors Group and, you know, we got Miss Benita helping us network organize. And I just expounding on what you're saying about passing the baton, because a lot of the young um, people living with HIV, we don't know our history. We don't know the political environment. Um, of this field, you know, so we need to learn all of that in order to continue to do the work. So I, I appreciate that part, and I think that's key. <laughs> um, before Bridget uh, goes, I might throw a monkey wrench a little bit in this uh, conversation flow, but I had a similar, I can understand the passing of the baton. Uh, we, I think we've both been a part of like, the Campaign to Nays and the Youth Action Institute, and wanting to teach and train and, and uh, uh, empower young people, like between 15 and 25, to take that next step once we can go sit down. So when I started working in the field and volunteering and just being a part of all of this, my thought was, we're gonna put our, we need to put ourselves out of business. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure we don't need, they don't need us anymore. We don't need to do this anymore mm -hmm. because we got it taken care of. Um, but it, it seems to get bigger and bigger and more expensive, and, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, but yeah, so I, I definitely understand kind of both sides of that. Um, it's a preventable and treatable disease. It's also something where, where we provided the, the proper interventions and resources and support, it would also go away. And we could focus on the other things, the more kind of perennial challenges that allow something like an HIV epidemic to exist in the first place. So I didn't mean to, I just want to intersect the... No, actually that kind of ties into what I'm, I was going to say, which is that um, you were talking about what we can do over the, like what the next five years looks like. And I think it can be carried forward. Assuming because, the cure is part of that. Yeah, yeah, right. So being involved in shaping what the cure looks like. Um, 
I am 100% positive the cure is gonna look different for me than it's going to look for you. And that is not just, phys that's not just emotionally, it is physically as well, right? Because our bodies act different. We have different hormones. We have all of these different um, things that affect me that don't affect you. And so it is critical that we are involved over the next five, 10 years in shaping what the cure looks like for each of us and those are lessons that we can then take forward and give back to the, the younger folks who are still acquiring HIV, who are still vulnerable to HIV until that happens. I, am, I say it every, everything I do, each one teach one. Without each one teaching one, we stay lost. There's no moving forward. We keep repeating, like you said, we keep repeating the same things over and over again. And so the way that we as a community stay connected is we stay involved and we try to reach outside of the community. We want people to think of HIV as, as more normal and less stigmatized, but we stay so insular because it feels safe. And we stay so, so tight within our community that we don't give other people the opportunity to see it as normal. Um, and so within Cure Research, there's ways that we can reach outside to bring other people in and that will keep us moving forward. Anyone else have thoughts on that? Sure, please. Okay. Um, I guess in my mind, mental health and housing are social services that we need to think more about as for people as, as we're aging and we're going towards a cure and we have people who are looking for HIV. These, to me, are areas that we have, have more funding put in them for us. Are there other, other social service things that we need to think about that we need to ramp up now? Because I think we've always been so reactionary to everything. And so, like we're talking about now, well, we're gonna have a cure and then what happens? So, what other things do you think? <laughs> I'm not a policy person, but I think, you know, we touched on it earlier, aging. I mean, everybody, you know, the, the majority of people are already over 50 probably gonna be another 10 years if we're lucky. Everybody's gonna be older. So I think geriatric services and not having these arbitrary cutoffs at 65, people age different rates, HIV is making us age faster, people at 50 may need services that are, are only available to people at, at 65. So I think that's an area where we can benefit our, ourselves and each other in the short term as well as the long term. So that's one short answer. So, so aging also includes, I, I hear what you're saying as far as geriatric uh, connections going beyond, yeah. but also from say 25 to 40. Yeah, yeah, well. absolutely, long term survivors. So I just want to just add something to what, what Jeff was saying about um, other social needs, right? I think that one thing we need to, we need to learn about money management. The little bit of money that we have Right, and how do we how do we how do we get an IRA? How do we get a retirement? Right, because a lot of us didn't think that we were going to live long enough to retire. Right, how do we get vocation? Vocation. How do we go back to school that we can earn a living for ourselves? Because when early on people used to get SSD or SSDI, they're not they're denying that now at every turn, and people don't have enough resources right, to live a quality life, right? So I think that's gonna be important. I get this AARP, this bag, I don't know what I'm supposed to put in this bag, right? What am I gonna, because I didn't, you know, they give me all these wonderful cruises, I don't have money to go on the cruise, you know, so who is this for? And I would love for it to be for me, but I don't think that we need an AARP for HIV. And I think that that kind of starts with having um, vocational and having trainings around how do we manage what we have, right? Like to make it last so that it makes a difference when we when we do age, that we can travel and whatever HIV looks like, look whatever life looks like for you beyond HIV, right? Like what would that take? For like for some people, for people who are not, maybe they're um and I'm going I'm going I'm not speaking on behalf of anybody that's not in the room, but I was told well, if you're not in the room, to bring them to bring them in the room with us. What about people whose gender assignment are not the same ID as, you know, and it's not safe for them to travel, right? Because what, it, what travel look like for me, I can say I want to travel, but it may not be the same for somebody that doesn't have, 
you know, the um, the, uh, the legal papers and stuff like that. So those are some other social things that we can learn to, um, how do we how do we get those type of IDs together so we can travel safely, right? So it's about safe, safety and thinking of our future and our economic status and those sort of things. I'm sorry, I think Andrew okay. had other yes. um, Yeah, I just wanted to talk about, uh, you know, some of the things that Waheedi was talking about um, far as, you know, how do we get AARP and things of that nature. You know, we had a great man in Philadelphia named John Bell. He said, it's always to teach somebody to take your place. Mm -hmm. Take your place, you know, and after Philadelphia, we say fight back, fight AIDS. You know, um, and that's what I look at the situation as, that we need to teach people, we need to educate people about this virus, you know. Mm -hmm. I agree. Teaching, teaching, passing that baton. Yep. Personally, I'm not quite ready for AARP, but I, I get what y'all are saying. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Yeah, I kind of relate to the anxiety and fear about having a cure, but there is another model. I'm a cancer survivor, and uh, it took almost three years of therapy. When there is survivor guilt, and there's uh, also uh, people that you have lost along the way in a cancer group. And so, um, but I, I made it through. And cancer has become a part of my life, and it disappeared entirely. So am I the same person, am I not? And so I think uh, with proper therapy, and the people who are cured will be able to survive and it will take time, and so you cannot cut off social services immediately because someone is cured, mm -hmm. but they need support for a long time because uh, having HIV must be traumatic. I don't have personal experience with it, but I can understand that it must be extremely traumatic to have it day in, day out, waking up with it every day. And so uh, I think that there would be support to make sure that these people are taken through the tunnel to the other side. Mm -hmm including mental health support, psychosocial support, etc. Yes. And, and housing, uh, uh, assistance, everything. I also think, I mean, unless we get like immune to it, you're still gonna be able to contract HIV. Like a cure doesn't necessarily mean you can't get it again, right? Yeah. Like, well, we're advocating that it, that, it yeah, right. Yeah. We don't want that kind of cure. No. <laughs> <laughs> What's the point? Um, my name is Marcia, I've been living with, as of next month, 30 years living w with HIV. And for me, I say that because more of my life has been with HIV than it hasn't. So I like what you said. My community was, after my diagnosis, was the LGBT community. It was, it is, I'm not was, it is the LGBT community. It's the HIV community. There's people around here who know me since I was 23 years old and just diagnosed. Dazon, Dixon, Charles have known me that long. Um, and then Moses. And I, my question, I really like what you said about the fact that the social economics would change because I'm on disability right now and my social security uh, worker says I'm on social security because I'm asymptomatic HIV. You and I know that's about as much, a, that, that's garbage. Because no one gets a disability for being asymptomatic on HIV. So I'm gonna tell the truth. I am not on disability for HIV. I'm on a disability for other things. But I receive housing services. I receive food, a food basket every month. I receive social support, uh, mental health support. I receive so many things that make my life so much better because of that. So I like what you said about that because where would I be without it? Uh, I'm not instantaneously without HIV. Doesn't mean I don't need those services. I all, um, but I do have a question. I have been known as a woman living with HIV practically since I was first diagnosed. Now, not everybody knows I'm positive in my world today, but there's a lot of people who know. The stigma, I don't feel, is going to change. 
because just as so much as people are slow to catch up to the fact that you equals you, and they haven't even got there, and they're still in the 80s and the 90s, how are you going to now say, oh, we're cured, and you're going to think the world is going to accept that? So as far as I'm concerned, if a cure comes along, and I would love to know what you guys think, if a cure, to me, the worst part about living with HIV is the stigma. That's the only part that makes my life miserable these days because the medications are no longer killing me. They were killing me back in the early 2000s and the 90s, but they're not doing that now. So the only bad part about this virus is the stigma. And if I'm still gonna have that stigma, even if I'm cured, what's the point of a cure for me? So I'm just wondering what your opinion is on that. That's a, that, that, that's a good, I, I didn't even think about that. Like, are they gonna believe that we cured? Cause they don't believe you equals you, right? They believe like, that we cured. <laughs> um, you know, I, that's a good uh, thought for us to all sit on, you know? Like, I don't know, like, will they believe it? I mean, yeah, I think so. I think that I would hope that they would believe that it's a cure. You know, like. So I think that, so the work doesn't stop because the cure comes. The work doesn't stop. We have to continue. It's our job, it's a part of our job as advocates to keep pushing back against stigma, right? And some of that starts with us teaching each other about how to not identify ourselves and come into a room and say, um, I'm HIV and I've been HIV um, for 20 years without saying my name. My mother didn't give me a name without identifying myself as a living, breathing, human being person with need, right? And, and also the need to be seen, to be visible, to be respected, and to have access to what I need for, for um, a quality life. So we want to continue to have to work on stigma. And there's stigma on arrest, and, and there's all, you know, there's, there's stigma against the, the mental health, right? But I think that when it comes to cure, I'm thinking about people who would like, who are, who are, people, people here in this conference that I know are on kidney, are, are waiting for kidneys right now, right? right? right. And I wonder would they, would they have rather had the kidney, or would they have rather have the HIV cure, right? right? And I can't, I can't even like, I can't even say what I think that they would feel, but there are so many needs and the work doesn't stop because the cure comes. That what happens then that the work begins again, right? But maybe in a different direction. I don't know who's gonna fund us. It probably won't be the pharmaceutical companies. Hey, okay. So we, hey, <laughs> there you have it. So that was, that was the ARP of HIV will come, will come. I don't know who's gonna make money off of Zen, but I'm not sure who would, who would fund us. If there was, if we did, if we, if, if it wasn't the pharmaceutical companies, if there, but well, we would be still taking their medicines. They, we would still be taking their medicines for the cure. Maybe they would keep continue to fund us, but yeah, we'll see what V says about that. <laughs> um, hi, my name is uh, Dr. Tyler Tremier, um, and I'm uh, I wear many hats. Um, I work with Ebony at San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Sometimes I feel like I work for her, she's amazing. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm also a person who's been living with HIV for 20 years. Um, I wanna connect with you, Portia, because I actually wrote uh, my dissertation on lifetime survivors um, about the challenges of transitioning people born with HIV from pediatric to adult content. Um, so I'd love to chat. Um, my, uh, it's more of a comment. I think I'm listening to what everyone is saying and a conversation I've been trying to have with funders now for a while is um, how do we start the policy version of this conversation now? Like we can't even agree in the current moment about how to continue to sustain the domestic response to HIV and if a cure is all of a sudden available um, and everyone's, um, uh, the roof over your head, the food on your table, all of the things that you just said are tied to your HIV status because of programs like Ryan White or because of programs um, that are funding. How do we begin to dismantle that now or create a new system that won't just drop people off or leave you in a tough place? Like, will you be in a place where you have to choose? Do I choose the cure or do I choose to remain HIV positive, taking medication so that I can keep these things that the federal government will pay for? And that is not an easy or a quick conversation. 
So yeah, how do we start that policy conversation? Folks are coming with great need now, and if someone says, oh, there's a cure, then why do they need money anyway? Just like what he said, we start having the conversation now. If um, we need to start making noise about policy. There are people that specialize in policy, and God bless them, because it's not my judge, but it's important, and so, starting to talk about it and starting to make noise about it and starting to insert ourselves into more spaces that are just not the, these spaces. We are we have to get outside of the spaces that we feel safe in and start to feel uncomfortable and start to make other people uncomfortable so that we can start those conversations not just start but we start putting pen to paper and we start making people move and do things. Nothing happens without advocacy, clearly. We wouldn't, how long did it take to get drugs? Advocacy did that. And so nothing happens without us making noise. And um, I firmly believe that we have to start pushing ourselves into spaces where we, tr we traditionally feel like we don't belong or other people feel like we don't belong, but we very, very, very much do. Um, and so if you're not uncomfortable, get uncomfortable. And just to piggyback on that briefly, I mean, there are a lot of people doing this work in HIV now. Um, Federal AIDS Policy Partnership is a good example, AIDS Watch. Now that this stuff is happening and we can just transition, as I said earlier, take those skills, leverage them for, for what needs to be done. Hi. 1992, I got on a bus with ACT UP New York to right. Bethesda. I came home three days later with a skull fracture, and a broken optical lobe, and a broken nose. And because of that demonstration with a lot of people, most of them are dead now, because of that arrest, and the subsequent arrests over and over again, that people like Jeff know about, and other people in this room know about, and most of us are getting real gray and have osteoporosis, and lipodystrophy, and lipopenia, and insulin tolerance, all the rest of this crap including the CBD that will take us out sooner or later. We have the drugs. It wasn't advocacy. It was activism. We made them so fucking uncomfortable, but they wouldn't leave their offices. And it's all documented in How to Survive a Plague. So let me tell you what's happening right now beyond this stigma discussion. Biotron Holdings, Biotech in Australia, working on a BPU inhibitor, there are three cents a share. American Gene Therapy, which is in Bethesda, Maryland, is at 24 cents a share. All the cure research that's coming down from industry is being abandoned. Keep talking about stigma, about who doesn't like us. They're never gonna like us. They sure as hell don't like me. And I served in the Marine Corps, and they threw me the fuck out with three Purple Hearts. They're never going to like us, and that's your goal, beautiful. But please, in the name of God Almighty, and for those of us who are living overseas, who are living in developing nations, which will never get antiretroviral therapy. Only one out of every seven people with HIV gets antiviral therapy through PEPFAR and the Global Fund, and they're going to die of opportunistic infections. The only way out of this is a cure, definitive cure, functional or sterilizing. And the companies that are working on that cure are going out of business because Gilead ain't buying them, and Vive ain't buying them, and the NIH stands for not invented here. <laughs> so here's the question. Who do we need to meet with in Bethesda? Now, now that Tony has finally gone to a retirement home, which we'll probably see him in, who do we need to meet with in Bethesda and when? Call the shot. The reunion projects in that position of leadership. Project Inform is gone. Act of New York is a shell. I hope there's somebody left in Act of Philly. Who do we start meeting with and when? Based on that. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you raised some really important points. And yeah, we're, we're back to the activism we need. I keep saying it's about aging stuff. It's like, we've got to get our walkers and our, um, <laughs> and our, and our wheelchairs and, and Chain them to the gates of the NIH so, so that they will listen. Also, I think another place to do this is the um, um, uh, UN Global Fund. 
at places like that as well. Because we can't rely on governments. There's so many, you know, we talk about the military industrial complex. There's the healthcare complex. And it's set up to be self-perpetuating. And, and we need to kind of break through that. It's going to take activism. I know this gentleman had a comment back in the corner there. In the very beginning, um, as a gay man, I was a buyer and traveled around the United States. And of course, San Francisco, everywhere. But in 1993, I went to New York to the, um, on a buying trip. And the guy was saying was, I walked in the door and he said, no sex. And he said, tomorrow we're gonna go see Larry Kramer's The Normal Heart. Mm -hmm. And the next day I'm taking you to where I volunteer. And it was the gay men's health crisis. And that all of a sudden changed my life. Only because two years before that, a group of us did a party. And of course, you know, back then, being gay, you couldn't be known or whatever. It was an underground party. We got in the bus, we dressed in drag. I was the first drag queen with a beard. And the drag queens called us dirty drag. <laughs> but we put on a drag show that October 7th, 1983, and we decided that we'd keep half of it in Indianapolis and half of it we'd send to the gay men's health crisis. That was 40 years ago. And through that, Indianapolis has been a forerunner of HIV. And of course, I was married and two children. So, you know, when I got HIV, it was a death sentence. So I had a flower business. I had to sell the business because even though I was a veteran, they weren't treating people. They were shutting the door on people with HIV. They didn't have the medicine and they didn't have the doctors. <clears throat> so all of a sudden, I had to get insurance because um, I wasn't taking HIV because my doctor told me not to. It was a drug, don't even get near it. You're gonna go through a plateau and you're gonna hit a brick wall. And I knew that. So I went to the hotel and I could sign up for insurance without even the medical thing. So I did. And within five years I hit that brick wall. But it was in 1996 I hit that brick wall. And that's when the viral that's when I could take a cocktail. And so right then and there, my whole life changed again because divorce, kids, the whole thing blew up in front of me. <clears throat> but it taught me something. The love that they gave me, even though I was HIV positive, made me stand out. And the bag ladies who I was raising money for, HIV, and we had the Damien Center, they embraced it. So all of a sudden, I became, a, the, we've always raised money, the back ladies, and so it didn't bother me to be, even newspapers, you know, to tell them that I was HIV positive. But the greatest thing is I was with VA, so I didn't have to do any of the um, medicine. And even though I talk, talk about it, <clears throat> if there is a cure, what are they gonna do for my neuropathy? And some of the other products that I now have, the biggest thing I worry about being survivors, last year I got cancer of the arm. And you know what, I have five friends, all died of cancer, and their death certificates doesn't say HIV. Even though they were HIV, it says cancer. So all of a sudden, some of the statistics about people dying with HIV, we're not seeing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, <laughs> um, a year ago, I started working for the Minority Health Coalition, which is an eye opener because before that I raised money. Now I see where the money goes. And the bag ladies last year raised $86,000 for the difficult. <laughs> And another thing was, in the beginning, the Ryan White Foundation started in Indianapolis. <laughs> and um, 
teeny white, I was a florist, and I did teeny white's second wedding. And during the wedding, she said, Kobe, Phil Donahue and Judith Lyle are coming to town, and we need to have a, a press conference. And I said, oh, we can do that. So I called Nancy Ursay and the Colts, and she said, of course. I said, you'll take the bar. But from that day on, when Phil Donahue took over, being the head of the YMY Foundation, things really started to move. Hey, thanks. Do you have my card? I did something silly and I followed the rules. I, I wrote on the card. Um, <laughs> Gold star for him. Hey, y'all. Uh, this is for the panel. Uh, my name is Sean. My pronouns are she, her. Also from Indianapolis. Hey, Colby. Um, my clients often ask about a cure, uh, yet so many people living with HIV have succumbed to the idea that they'll live with it forever, for their lifetime. Um, I think hope is really important for all people. Uh, so my question is, you know, as I work with people living with HIV, from newborn to people over 80, you know, my youngest client is six months old. My oldest client is 83. Um, what can I share with them to instill hope for a cure? You know, right now, I, I go back and I talk about the history, you know, the history of medicines and the advancements we've had in treatment. Um, but what else can I share with them to instill hope uh, for a cure specifically? Or what would you want to hear? Yeah, um, you said you're in Minneapolis, is that right? Indianapolis. Indianapolis, okay. Mm -hmm. There are people doing research all over the place, but definitely share with them, you know, the webinar series. There's all kinds of things online. Let people know we're trying to make, make this accessible. We can't be everywhere, but, but it's happening. And I think just letting them know that, you know, progress is being made is, is the way to do it. This is what we're doing this work for, why we're having this and, and making things available on, online so people everywhere can, can know what's happening. I would say to tell them to find community, yeah. right? For me, you talk about hope. Laughter is hope for me. If I lose my sense of humor, we all done. So um, remember to remind them that laughter is hope and that, like I said earlier, HIV is not all darkness, right? It, it's more than, than stigma. It's more than disease. It's more than, it is, um, it's community. So their hope for cure lies in us being together as a community and working towards that. Just add into what Bridget is saying that that social connectedness piece, um, the, the definition, the alternative definition of cure that I read at the beginning, you know, how, that's how you, you know, cope with, with the virus mentally and spiritually is, is being connected to people that are going through the same thing that you're going through so you don't feel isolated or ostracized in your experience, um, and then just being able to see uh, within that social connectedness piece is being able to see people who have been living with HIV for a long time, you know, because you, you can hear it from your doctors or providers, like, you know, the treatment has come a long way, um, you can live a long and healthy life, but if you don't see examples of that, like, then it's kind of, you know, that that's the part about the social connectedness connectedness piece that like has helped me seeing um, uh, other women living with HIV, living a normal healthy life, being married, having babies, breastfeeding, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. And um, yeah, just I would you know let them know that U equals U is it's not a it's as close to. Um, a cure to me, yes, I think so. I would also add that sometimes we we have to like know when we're winning. You know, I feel like a winner. I don't feel like a loser with HIV. I'm not. I'm thriving with HIV. That's right. I'm living. I'm living in spite of HIV. In fact, I'm living on purpose. So sometimes we have to know when we're winning. And I would encourage you to let them know that this is something that they've won. 
they have other things to think about. Like I'm, I'm the geriatric girl, right? So if we're talking about people who are old, they probably have some other geriatric stuff to, to that's going. To, if it hasn't come up, it's coming up. But I think I would encourage them to give themselves some credit for having lived through an epidemic, for having because they thought we wouldn't be here. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, we have we we have we're in a baby boomer stage yeah. of people living with HIV. They're not, they're not ready for us. They were not ready for all of us to still be here, right. right? So we're living in a world that's not ready for us, right? But 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 yeah, but I would I would that's what I would encourage them to like look at the glass as being half full. The glass is never half empty. It's always half full. So I would tell them like yeah, eat cake. Give them some cake. <laughs> Give them some cake. I appreciate Hi, I'm Dawn Breeden from Florida by way of New Jersey, and I, where, where he go? Act up. Where he go? Did he still yeah. Yeah. Oh, there he is. I remember you. And GMAC in 1992, um, up, all the way upstairs, there was this big room because we were desperate for help. And anything that we could do up there, I'm so grateful for every step of the way. Yes, now I take the red, white, and blue pills, right? But there was time when I took 32 vitamins a day. There was times I had never shot um, drugs in my arm, but I did intravenous vitamin C treatments, whatever I could do. So I'm so grateful for every step of the way that we have come. I was diagnosed one month before Magic Johnson went public, so you know everybody was, and they gave me nine months. Aren't y'all glad they couldn't count? <laughs> and the most important thing that I always tell people is, listen, everybody's gonna die, you gotta figure out you know, how you're gonna go along the way. And it's so important that we stay encouraged, and like you said before, this community, I wouldn't trade y'all for nothing in the world. People have no clue what it's like. They go, you HIV positive, you ain't got a clue. You don't have a clue. And, and how many, will y'all not agree? Is there a lot worse things than HIV? So, my entire family died from complications from diabetes. I'm still here. They was looking at me going, oh, you gonna do it? Well, you better take care of yourself. Okay. I am so grateful for every step of the way. So I've been on the um, Zoom calls with the aging, so I'm, I'm up on that. I'll be on there next week too. Just, just you know, keep keep hope alive. Okay, keep hope alive. I will be here when there is a cure. And I'm like, what, what you say? I, I'm gonna be 20 in line too. Okay, because you know, unfortunately, <laughs> like y'all have just said, with every solution, it creates another problem. So we already know that, but I'm doing good. People still look at me and go, you got what, right? I'm doing good. And you look good. And, and okay, don't, don't we look good? <laughs> and I think you know a big part of fighting the stigma is us being public, those of us that are, I'm not saying everybody should be, I'm not saying everybody should be, but newspapers, TV, wherever I'm there. People walk up to me and say, I, I seen you somewhere. There's a billboard, I don't know, okay? But I'm so grateful, and unfortunately, I don't accept the stigma. I just don't accept it. So if you got an issue with what you think of HIV, that's your issue. It's not on me. But I, every step of the way, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be sitting in this room right now because I am a long-term survivor. Right, right, right. Sure. Two more questions for the panelists. Thank you. My name is Holden Brown. I'm from San Francisco. I've been diagnosed for 32 years. I'm 79 years old. So here's my question. When HIV is cured, you're talking about we would have to find jobs and we have to go looking for this and that. Does that think when HIV is cured, the damage to your body is already done? So the question is, are we still considered to be disabled? 
Will we still have services or will we have to go back in and start all over again fighting for the right for people who did not have the opportunity to get out there and get the services that we they need to get the education to get go find a job to find means to take care of themselves they were still dependent on the services they were given they have studies like where they're like studying children who were born negative but like mm -hmm. um there, there we go, it's a HIV exposed but uninfected, and they have different health complications yeah. and stuff like that. Like, it's, stu it's shown in studies, so they're gonna have to create another category for us, I think, when the cure is, becomes available, because we're gonna be, we're not gonna be like, just regular um, uninfected, people I and mean, you know like like you said the damage is already done so i think it's going to be like a whole nother well, i don't know. know yeah like a whole nother category that we're going to like move into mm -hmm. okay but i'm saying not only that you're talking about the children the youngsters yes they will learn much quicker than the seniors like me but what i'm saying is what about the people who have been out there all their life yeah, you're right. And one of the things that we haven't really touched on here is the medical system and um, all of the challenges. You know, I'm black. The system ain't broke. It's made how it's supposed to and it's working the way it's supposed to. But the system needs an overhaul. And it right now, even right now, cure set aside. It's leaving the older population behind. It is so, because everything is so siloed, HIV is a specialty. Liver is a specialty, kidney is a specialty, cancer is a specialty. And you have to go to all of these different places and all of these different appointments. How does someone of age, who's not as mobile as they used to be, how do you get to those appointments? So those are things, you're absolutely correct, and those tie back into the policy that you were talking about. These are, are systems that need to be revamped, reworked, um, and re-examined so that we can start to, not start to, because we should have been done it, mm -hmm. so that we begin to get to where we need to be, let alone where we need to go. Yeah, I mean, we all know our healthcare system is broken. It's not working for anybody very well. It works better for some than others because of structural racism and other issues. But you know, I just buried a 92-year-old mother. I watched her die of wasting and could not get care. She died at 85 pounds because she couldn't eat and keep up. In. So this, the geriatric um, healthcare model is not working. Other countries have figured this out. There are models out there that work. We need to be advocating for that for everybody. So thank you so far. We're approaching the end of the session, but just a reminder before we go that if you have that blue piece, uh, the blue uh, index card, uh, to write down the most important thing you learned today or what still remains unclear, or if you think about how this conversation is flowing, how can you uh, reestablish this conversation in your hometown, in your neighborhood, with your network, with your community? What would you need to do that uh, from the reunion project? Yes. <laughs> and um, before we get this last question, I'm going to uh, pass it back to our panelists for their final thoughts. So, if there's any more questions. Um, my name is Krista Martell um, from Memphis Sheep Herd, and I'm with the Well Project, and so I can't help but notice the three beautiful women on this panel, <laughs> three beautiful black women, and um, and as an organization that focuses on women, we've been perfectly involved and, and directly involved in some, you know, strategies around how to engage women in HIV care research and clinical trials, and um, because the first time that they even did an analysis was we asked someone from AMPAR to look at it and there was, you know, at the most 10% participation of women, more often 5% or less, sometimes 1%. Um, and so I know, I didn't say baseball, but Bridget is involved in some work to kind of look at what it would take for women or what, you know, what, what are some strategies and fears of women, and so I'm just wondering if you could share some of that, or if Bridget, I mean, <laughs> Bridget, Portia and Mahita also, just to, you know, from a woman-centered lens, like, involving in HIV care research. 
So, um, uh, you know, a lot of the hesitations are things that we've talked about. There's mistrust, there's distrust, there is, first of all, we're not even being asked, right? Like, they say there's no women in research and women don't want to do research, but you're not asking. And not only are you not asking, you're not presenting it in a way that works for home, family, work, all of that, right? These are minor things that there's enough money to be over to, to be able to overcome. Um, and the other part is that because of some of that mistrust and distrust and time, um, women are not presenting themselves in a way that makes them accessible. And so I was talking about it earlier. If you don't get involved with the cure, the cure you get may not be the one that works for you. And so it's really, really important that um, institutions start to look at the way that they are trying to engage women and that we as women encourage our community to get involved and to be a part of it. Yeah, um, I think I'm sorry, Krista, Krista. Tell me the question again. I mean, I'm sorry. From a women specific lens of getting, like, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. I was way out in the, I was out in the Kuiper Belt somewhere. I'm back. Um, so what I was going to say, I was going to, I want to talk about the entire life cycle of women, right? So because when it comes to research and women then with HIV, uh, we need to, we, we, we have, I'm a postmenopausal woman, right? And I'm not, and, and I remember when there was a time when they would only have women of, um, of a childbirth age, say mm -hmm. like from 35 to 45 or something, then you can get into, you can get into clinical trials if you were 55. But I don't know that there's any clinical trials for women over 55, and we also go into menopause earlier than women who are not living with HIV. So there's so much research to be done for on women along the life cycle. You're talking about uh, having children, raising families, and and being able to have uh, children, uh, breast and chest feeding, right? And so then we're, then we're middle-aged women, and then we have the drop in the estrogen that goes down, right? And all of our bodies are going through hormonal changes. Um, and um, yeah, and we're taking medicines that weren't designed for us, right? I tell people, I said, you know, and I know from a black, from black community, we always, our word is guinea pig. I don't want to be a guinea pig, right? But we take medications that we were not a part of the studies for at all. They just happen to work. But then there's side effects to everything that we take, right? So, um, yeah, I would also encourage um, our communities, and I would encourage researchers to, um, to, to engage in meaningful involvement of people living with HIV. Because we can tell you what studies will work, what studies won't work. We used to come down here, um, to HVTN used to have a, um, their annual, um, um, a conference down here, and we would go in as people living with HIV. We would go in uninvited because they never invited us. Mm -hmm. So Sten Vermont, he was the head of the H H HPTN years ago, and some one, some one of us knew him, and he said, "Well, just tell him Sten said you could come in." But he was nowhere around. He gave us his cell phone and everything, but when we got in and they were trying to put us out, he was nowhere around. But we would go into these sessions, and the sit on the door closed session. And we were going to these closed sessions. And I would, I'm, I'm not the only one that went to the buffet, let me just say that, but <laughs> I'm not the only one, but I would go in and make myself like I was invited and people would stop me and ask me, do you know um, why you're here? Why are you here, do you know? I said, this is about HIV, right? Yes, but do you understand what we're doing here? Do you know? I said, yes, I'm here to represent my community. Even though I wasn't invited. You don't have to invite me in. I can take my place and I took my place in and, and I, I'm a good listener. So when they pass the, the thing around, who wanna be on the listserv? I put my name to be on the listserv. Mm -hmm. Oh, the next meeting's at Columbia University? I can get to New York. Mm -hmm. So the next meeting there I was, I was at Columbia University. They was looking at me like, here she is again. <laughs> yes, I'm here to represent my community. Because some of the studies, some of the questions that you're trying to ask, I can answer that question. They're not, listen, they're not gonna let, you not, we're, not, we're not gonna let you cut our hair. Some of us have braids or dreads, and that's spiritual for us. We're not going to let you take our fingernails. Some of most of them are acrylic. 
<laughs> right? So there's some things I know, right? And we're not going to say they were doing the. I'm sorry. I'm, I hope I'm not taking up too much time. And so, and so every time they would look up, there I was. Here she is again. Next thing I knew, that was on the agenda. And while he did, you have something you want to say. My name was on the agenda because I kept coming back, right? And I have a right to be wherever they're discussing HIV. We have a right to be there, you know. And um, we would we would call ourselves Prague. People thought we had something to do with Germany. It was prevention research. I forget. We had some fancy some some some. Um, uh, we used some initials acronyms to say who we were. But we were making ourselves available to researchers, and at one point we would I would even I would even like just call them. I had phone numbers. I would just call and say, "Hey, what you working on? You want me to talk to the community about anything?" And so we have to we talk about MEPA. MEPA goes both ways. We can't sit back and wait for MEPA. Sometimes we have to create equity. Has to be created. Right? Equality and equity is different. Equality means you got it. Equity means can you get it? Right? So we have to create equity. Right? So that's something that's something that we do as a community. And we have to go into these spaces and not just go once. We have to continue to show up, continue to show up because it takes a while before they see you. They don't want to see you, right? So yeah, I would um, encourage us all like to to be consistent, to be consistent to be, um, keep coming back, find out where they are, find out where they're having these meetings, and invite yourself in, have a seat. You, if, and, and like the lady said earlier in the, in the, um, in the, uh, the uh, plenary, if there's no seat for you at the table, bring a folding chair. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Rita, it's a really powerful model, kind of ground up grassroots activism. Yes. But you know, we start at the bottom, we also need to start at the top and go down. Yes. You know, I've served on the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, which has done a lot of the, the really important research over the years, for the last 30 years. And, you know, I've been there. Lots of amazing women advocates have been there. We're at the table. They design these studies and say, and we tell them, you need more women. You need to have targets. Just don't say, well, enroll women. You need to say, we need 20, 30%. Right. You need to have funding for the child care, stipends, yes. and so forth. So they're not oh, losing yes. money by participating in these trials, because they've got lives and jobs and kids and families to take care of. Right. And you know, to their credit, most researchers are receptive to that, and they say, you're right. They write it in, and then when it comes time to the budgets and the committees above them, higher pay grades say, we don't have enough money, cut this, this, and this. All that stuff goes away, and, and the women don't get enrolled. So we need to start at the top with the funders and say, exactly. Well, but you know, the research, but in top positions, making the decisions, the decision makers too. Thank you. So before I pass it to Ebony for our last, well, sure. Okay. I was just gonna, yeah. I was just gonna echo what Wahia and Bridget both said to tune in, like tune in to the research that's being done um, in the community advisory board space for many of the Martin Delaney collaboratories. There's a lot of rich discussion in those meetings, and a lot of it does seem pretty daunting and very like, <laughs> I don't know if I can understand this in a way. Um, that someone else might understand it, but like tuning in consistently, I think has been helpful for me. And then also communicating that to the community that I serve as well. So if you can tune in, if you need to know where to tune in to, like ask someone, cause there's someone who's connected to someone who knows how to tune in. So I'll just offer that. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you for all of the questions, all of the input. Thank you, panelists, but you don't go anywhere yet because we're gonna get your final thoughts before and in your final final thoughts. So the reunion project in partnership with the National Working Positive Coalition does these two-day town halls all around the country. And we work with local host committees who then develop the program, develop everything from the program to the food to the theme. So and each theme like uh, 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 Charlotte. Bre Charlotte breaking <laughs> boundaries with resilience. Uh, is the theme of the Charlotte um, Town Hall. Mm -hmm. the, the New Orleans host committee is working on their theme now. What I would like our panelists to do in their closing is to think of the theme of the two-day town hall that is scheduled right after you know there's a cure coming. Think about that. And while they're thinking about that, I wanted to check with our audience. First of all, thank you for staying. Thank you for participating. Thank you for, for sharing this experience with all of us. Um, if any of you have on your card, like. What are your next steps? Do you have questions that you've heard something 
uh, new today, or there's something you need to hear more of, get more information on, or what do you need to continue this conversation in your community? How many of you have uh, written suggestions, ideas, or are just floating in your head? You haven't taken time to put them on pen. Yes, ma'am. Well, I could. I really am. <laughs> I just am so heartened by the community here. And what I thought about, especially, I was thinking about it, and then you spoke, and you talked about the years you were private about it, yeah. and you didn't have that community yet that probably seems indispensable now. And how do we reach out to people who are still hiding mm -hmm. in fear? I mean, you talk, that is one of your missions is to fight stigma, so that's what we have to do. But God, it's so hard to coax people. It's gonna be okay. There's this great community and so much hope with it. And sometimes people's place where they're living and their even family are not helping. They're, they're against them. And it's just so scary to, to reach out. So I don't know um, what kind of things more we can do to help coax people out into this warm community. My website is dawnbreeding.com. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not selling anything on there. You can just go on there and see my story. There's videos on YouTube. Um, so the more that they see people, then, and then even still, um, I'm always saying, you know, if anybody can contact me, I run a national um, positive only support group online on Wednesdays from 2.30, from 2 to 3.30. So I just embrace, I don't tell people, you know, oh, you need to be public because that's not for everybody to do, but they will find <coughs> within the community the wind beneath their wings. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Yes. And it's, and it's less, I, I completely understand and respect what you said. It's less about coaxing and just going to where people are. Listening to what they have to say, what they need. Start there and then you get kind of into that space, build that trust, build that comfort and familiarity both ways. So thank you for sharing. Anyone else want to share? Yes, ma'am. I just want to say one thing. Y'all can hear me, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So yes, my name is Lisa Jocelyn and I'm from Alabama and September 18th is National HIV AIDS Aging Awareness Day. And so I'm having my first Thank you. Lisa, by the way, is one of the co-chairs of the Birmingham Town Hall. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. thank you. All right, again, thank you. Yes. So, so my car is in the back. My name is Wahidi Chabazel, but I'm also from Philadelphia, and we have a we have a program there that we've given to. It's an adult literacy health program that gives people living with HIV an instant extended family. It's called Project Teach. And we have what we call Teach Expansion Program. We're doing it now. We have a couple of members that are here out there sharing the information out. But if you take my card from the table in the back and contact me, we can see what we can do with Teach Expansion in your area. And it's, it's a great model that we're sharing with the world. I'm a project, a product of Project Teach. Teach stands for Treatment, Education, Activists, Combating HIV. And it's a wonderful, wonderful program. It gives people living with HIV an instant, extended family. You're in a room with 25 people just like you. And that's kind of like how it starts. To kind of just real quick add on to what, it's, it's really not about coaxing because some people will never want to be in the light and some people don't want to be associated with people that are known to have HIV because you're guilty by association. But there are wonderful online resources that you can direct people to. Um, the Well Project is one for women and girls living with HIV. It was a lifesaver for me and I know um, a lifeline for several other people. So reminding folks that not everything has to come to the light Yes. Right? So, and it's, it's perfectly okay yes. to be quiet yes. and be, be still and still thrive. You can still thrive and still be happy even if you're not shouting your status to the world. Mm -hmm. this, must be a, this is a good application for the, the, the internet where people can be private. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Right. If I can't feel, okay. I relate to this. This is my view because still might want to be quiet about it. One of the very few silver linings of uh, virtual environment. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, first, I want to say we're please remember to fill out the evaluations. 
and join me in thanking our panelists. And they're going to leave us with their final thoughts along with their theme. And then <laughs> all girls need to do your project. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, with that being said, maybe the reunion project can do like a retreat or something, like a two day retreat celebration kind of thing like okay we got the cure and then what's next yeah. but like kind of like a ce celebratory like retreat we'll do a week a week <laughs> 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 what's next type thing i don't know that's the only thing that came to mind <laughs> that was not supposed to be the final <laughs> <laughs> we didn't, we didn't discuss this at all. Um, the only thing that comes to my mind is, is we're still here. And not only are we still here, we're going to continue to thrive. That's it, that's all. I'm not settling for anything else. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Party, party, party. We, we need to celebrate. That's a huge win. But then, you know, all the stuff that came up here today, right? What happens next? We still have these comorbidities. The work is not done. We just need to shift and make sure that we are not left behind. We are not forgotten. We deserve to thrive. Thank you, everyone. Please scan the QR code for the evaluation. No, that's for the website. I'm sorry. For the website, please fill out your evaluation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for being here all week. Thank you so much for all you do. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Happy Friday.